Welcome, I'm Rose Aguilar, and this is your call. For billions of people around the globe, it's impossible to think about life without a cell phone. We now use it for just about everything. But do you know how your cell phone actually works? Did you know that every cell phone manual includes fine print about radiation exposure? The iPhone manual, for example, suggests you keep your phone at least five-eighths of an inch away from your body and use carrying cases or belt clips that maintain five-eighths of an inch separation from the phone and your body. And then the BlackBerry Torch manual advises users to keep the device almost an inch from their bodies, including the abdomens of pregnant women and the lower abdomens of teenagers. So why isn't this information widely known if it's in the fine print? of the phone box itself in the manual? Well, in 2010, the city of San Francisco passed a right-to-know bill to educate consumers about potential cell phone risks, but the telecom industry fought very hard against it. Why? Today's guest, Kevin Coons, wanted to find out why this information isn't widely known. His new award-winning documentary, Mobilize, examines the potential harmful effects of cell phone radiation. He speaks with scientists, doctors, politicians, telecom industry execs, and people whose health has been adversely impacted by long-term cell phone usage. So what do we need to know about potential long health, long-term health effects from cell phone radiation, and what does the science tell us? Kevin Coons is a Bay Area-based filmmaker and director of the documentary Mobilize, and he joins us in studio. Hi, Kevin. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you very much for having me. It's nice to have you. We're also also joined by Joel Moskowitz. Joel is director of the Center for Family and Community Health at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health, and he spends quite a lot of his time on this issue. Hi, Joel. Welcome to the show. Uh, good morning, Rose. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to have you. I should also say that Joel's center specializes in disease prevention. He also covers electromagnetic radiation health effects and policies. So, Kevin, I understand that... You started this film back in your last year in college. You really started asking yourself questions Mm -hmm. because you use your phone, like so many of us, as a camera. You were just taking a bunch of pictures before we went live as a TV remote and as a buzzer to let your friends into your apartment. What got you thinking about the health effects? Well, you know, I was taking a class at the University of San Francisco, and the class was about PSAs. And they said, you know, go out and shoot a PSA for a nonprofit. So I went onto my Facebook and I wrote a status update saying I'd love to do a pro bono PSA for a nonprofit. And I got a lot of responses and some people private messaged me saying, oh, we'll pay you. You don't need to tell your professor, you know. But I got one message from a fellow student, uh, Zach Marks, who told me his father developed a brain tumor after using his phone for about 20 years and since then, him and his mom started the nonprofit California Brain Tumor Association. And so ever since then, I got very interested. And so it started out as, you know, a minute long PSA. And then I started interviewing more people like Joel at UC Berkeley. And all of a sudden, I had hours and hours of footage. And I said, you know, we need to make a feature film out of this. How did you decide how to go about this? Because there's. I mean, what does the science tell us right now? We've done so many shows about this, and there's a lot. There, there, there are very few long-term studies, right? Is that still the case today? I'm going to pass that question over to Joel because he's such an expert on the science. Joel? Actually, there are quite a few now uh, studies looking at cell phone users who have used up to 25 years or more. The latest studies are finding for those who've used cell phones or cordless phones for 25 or more years, a threefold risk of brain cancer and a fourfold risk of a tumor on the nerve from the ear to the brain, acoustic neuroma. Uh, studies looking at 10 or more years, most of the studies have looked at 10 or more years of, of cell phone use, and they typically find a, a doubling of risk of brain cancer and also of uh, acoustic neuroma. Besides the cancer risk, we have other studies showing evidence of sperm damage, male infertility from men who keep the phone in their uh, pocket in their pants. We have evidence of reproductive health effects uh, for women who are exposed during pregnancy, effects on the offspring uh, playing out in terms of uh, neurological disorders, uh, 
laboratory research suggests that the the effects are predominantly on the hippocampus, which is important for learning and memory. So it's not surprising uh, that we're seeing uh, effects that correspond to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, and that's been observed uh, in children as well as in uh, mice, according to the researchers who've looked at mice exposed during pregnancy, the fetal effects. So we have a whole variety of effects uh, that have been well documented. Some of this research goes back to the 60s and 70s. Uh, the federal government has known about this uh, for a long, long time. The U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency published a review in 1976 where they declared that low-intensity microwave radiation does indeed create biologic activity and has potential harm to humans. In uh, 1988, the U.S. Air Force did a review. There was more evidence available then. They also they reiterated the findings of that early report and also raised concerns about the kind of pulsed low-intensity microwave radiation being used for wireless communication systems uh, that were de being developed, including cellular, cordless, and Wi-Fi radiation. So we've known for a long time uh, about the risks. The military and the defense industry were prime culprits in getting the EPA defunded back in the 90s about uh, from doing any research on this, but as the EPA was finding more and more evidence from these exposures causing uh, biologic harm, uh, the military and defense industry was became threatened. The s telecom industry is sort of the torch has been passed over to them, and they've been suppressing uh, any any efforts to raise awareness among the public or to create uh, funding mechanisms that are independent of industry, funded by government in the U.S. So the government, the U.S. government, has been particularly ne negligent in regulating this industry, uh, and also in terms of funding research. That is Joel Moskowitz. He's director of the Center for Family and Community Health at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health. And Joel focuses on electromagnetic radiation health effects and policy. He also runs the Facebook page, Electromagnetic Radiation Safety. So let's talk about some basics here. Ellen Marks, the founder of the California Brain Tumor Association, says in the film that every single cell phone emits some radiation. And Kevin, you visited this really interesting place called Seticom. It's a cell phone testing facility with 20 years of experience. And this is the institution that basically takes a look at what happens when you put your phone up to your ear, what happens with your brain. And it was fascinating to watch how they test this. Uh, so talk a little bit about that, because they specifically look at the heat effect, specific absorption rate, or SAR, and that is how much heat is absorbed into the head when we put the phone directly on our ear. So, yeah, I went to their facility, and they, you know, work with Apple and Google, and they also have international uh, facilities, too. Um, uh, so I had my phone tested there, you know, and it basically took like 15, 20 minutes. It was not a very long procedure. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, they said it fits within the regulation. And then I, I spoke with uh, someone. I interviewed him for a while. And, you know, the feeling was that the industry is trying to prevent further testing from being done. They like this little hurdle. They don't want to raise the bar higher. Because if they did, items like Google Glass might not be available. Hmm. And Google Glass actually is one of the highest rated SAR or radiation, you know, the highest rate of radiation for a cell phone out there today. Oh, really? Um, well, and it's the not the top, but it, it is up there. But the thing about the Google Glass is it's always on your head. Yeah. I mean, because right now, I mean, a lot of people say, obviously, people are not going to stop using their cell phones, mm -hmm. but just make sure you have it a distance away. Don't put it on your head. Don't put it in your pocket. But with these Google Glasses, it's always on your head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that is certainly something to be concerned about, and especially, you know, seeing that presentation where, you know, the people were, you know, d diving into the building and then riding on the motorcycles and everything, and yet at the same time it's streaming HD video to, you know, the project projectors. It was just... Um, you know, surprising how much information can be transmitted. Well, and it's also interesting to look at how they measure 
SAR, again, specific absorption rate or how much heat is absorbed into the head when you're on the phone. And so they, they're taking a model of a head and assuming that all of our ears are 10 millimeters thick and then put the cell phone on the ear. So there's 10 millimeters between the phone and your head and then see how much heat is being absorbed. But this is based on this, that, you know, the fact that, or not the fact, but based on an idea that we all have the same head as a 200 pound man and that all of our ears are 10 millimeters thick. Yeah, it doesn't look at all at, for pregnant women or children. So this um, safety standard that we have is really a joke right now and it's quite alarming. And so because of that, a lot of other countries um, have issued precautions to warn people, you know, to keep the phone about a safer distance away or to use a headset or speakerphone. And some of these countries that have, you know, started to issue precautions include Germany, Switzerland, Israel, the United Kingdom, France, and Finland. So the United States is really um, falling behind here on this issue, considering we were the first to really think about implementing it back in 2010 with San Francisco. Well, and then also what's interesting is, as you point out, and we've talked about this on past shows, that if you read the fine print of the manual in your cell phone, which I would be willing to bet that most people don't, mm -hmm. um, the iPhone, for example, says, keep your phone at least five eighths of an inch away from your body and then use a carrying case or a belt clip that maintains five eighths of an inch separation from the phone and your body. And as you point out, the BlackBerry Torch manual says keep the device almost an inch from your body, including the abdomen of pregnant women and the lower abdomen of teenagers. So they get pretty specific in their manual. Yes, they do. And what's surprising is now a lot of cell phone companies aren't even giving the manual out anymore. They're burying it on a website online or in the cell phone. So, for instance, I have the iPhone and I have to go into my settings. And then from settings, I have to go into general. Hmm. And then from general, I have to go into about. Oh, wow. And then after that, I go all the way down to legal. And then after that, I go into RF exposure. And then I can see in tiny, tiny print to keep it an inch away. And you know how most iPhones, you can zoom in on the screen. You cannot actually do that with this print. So it's it's and you can't even flip the screen to make it bigger either. So it's like the biggest feature of the iPhone isn't even available for the legal warning where they're telling you to keep it away from your body. So they're basically designing this so you can't find the information yeah. or you have to go through five steps. Yeah. And we're we're looking at this right now and it's really hard to read. Yeah. And what was surprising was when I interviewed Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, how he said that this was actually OK for him and that he was OK with this. And I said, you know, why why would you be okay with that? And, you know, he's like, well, I know to keep, you know, I don't put it next to my head. And I'm like, yeah, but not everyone is as smart as you, you know. Not everyone reads the fine print warnings. And, and his basically explanation was, well, everything comes with a fine print warning nowadays. And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, usually they put it on the box. You know, if it's cereal, they tell you what you're getting, how much sugar exactly what. And with a cell phone, the the assumption basically was that, with a cell phone, you are not absorbing anything into the body. That was the assumption. Right. And the facts are that when you hold your cell phone next to your brain or you put it in your pocket, you are absorbing part of that into your body. And depending if you're a child, you know, you have a thinner skull, a developing brain, you're absorbing a lot more radiation. So that's what really struck me. Um, you know, I currently work in public education and so I find it incredibly fascinating to see children using cell phones. You know, it's it, it's great that they can learn things so quick on them, but I'm also very alarmed by the fact how they're not being educated how to use them safely when a lot of other countries are educating um, youth to use them safer. That is Kevin Coons. He is director of the new award-winning documentary Mobilize. It explores the potential long-term health effects from cell phone radiation, including cancer and infertility. And for this documentary, Kevin interviewed scientists, doctors, politicians, telecom industry executives, and people whose health has been adversely impacted by long-term cell phone usage. We're also joined by Joel Moskowitz. He's director of the Center for Family and Community Health at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health. His center specializes in health promotion and disease prevention. He covers electromagnetic radiation health effects. He also has a Facebook page that he runs, Electromagnetic Radiation Safety. And you can give us a call if you've got any questions about cell phones. Have you read the fine print? Do you even know where to find it? Do you have the information 
that you think you need to make the right choice in terms of where to hold the cell phone, where to put it by your body. I mean, I know a lot of kids sleep with the phone under their pillow. A lot of women put it in their sports bras when they work out. So what questions do you have about all of these issues? And if you work in the industry, we'd love to hear from you. If you work in public health, we'd love to hear from you. The toll-free number is 866-798-8255, 866-798-8255. Five, five. You can also email feedback at yourcallradio.org or leave a comment on our website, yourcallradio.org. We have an email from David who says, with the trend moving toward wearable devices like Google Glass, the new iPhone watch, does that mean that people will now have a continual dose of radiation directly on their person? And how can the industry possibly justify this? Uh, Joel, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, the answer to that question is yes, they will have uh, continual exposure to um, wireless radiation. The industry likely justifies it because they will claim it's very low intensity uh, microwave radiation. For one thing, we should be aware that the industry as well as the federal government currently denies that this low intensity radiation has any bio- biologic ef- activity or at least it has any potential for harm. Yet all of the research I was citing earlier uh, was based on studies of essentially legal uh, devices that met the legal standard, uh, and so they essentially are low-intensity devices. Uh, recently, uh, the chief editor-in-chief of a major electromagnetic biology and medicine journal sent me uh, his collection of abstracts for recent studies. The collection included 481 uh, biologic studies looking at low-intensity radio frequency energy. Fully 75% of them found evidence of bioeffects, and most of those effects were harmful. So the, the current standard, which is based on this uh, SAR rating, S-A-R, is really set to prevent harm from the heating effect or the thermal effect from microwave radiation. But all of these studies, uh, these biologic studies, and all of the effects that are being observed in the human studies are non-thermal effects. They're low-intensity exposures. One of the problems, even with very low-intensity exposure, is that there's this line of research that goes back several decades that shows that very low intensity exposures open the blood brain barrier. And the reason why this is a bad thing is because we have many chemical toxins in our blood system from all the various uh, chemical exposures we uh, encounter in the home and in the workplace and in the public. Uh, Allowing these toxic chemicals into our brains is not a good idea. And we have evidence in one, one study of children uh, that followed children over time that found within those chi- among those children who had slightly elevated lead levels in their blood, a dose-response relationship not between the amount of lead in their blood but the amount of cell phone use they engaged in and the likelihood that they had attention deficit hyperactivity. In there term- are autism researchers, too, who believe uh, that there is a connection between these exposures and autism. It may not be a direct effect. It may have to do with this blood-brain barrier penetration and other toxins. Uh, But they can't get funding to do research currently from the government. In terms of uh, Google Glass, um, I did a short video piece about this on my website, mobilizemovie.com, and you can check out. And I spoke with the Google spokesperson about this. And essentially, all they could refer me to is an eye doctor, where the eye doctor said, oh, yes, you know, and they had nothing in terms of long-term studies about Google Glass and the effects on the brain or the body. And when I spoke with this person, this Google press person on the phone, they were very agitated. I was doing this video piece about them. They were like, why are you singling us out? You know, we, we feel like, you know, you could make this about so many different products, I said, well, you're the only one who has this wearable device that you put right next to your eyes and your face. Four million people have pre-ordered the iPhone 6, and Apple is yet to release the SARS for the the iPhone 6. I went on the FCC website last night and was able to find the documentation for the iPhone 6 because it had been recently posted. Well, for one model, there's about two dozen reports. For the other model, there's about three dozen reports. So I I started pouring through these reports, but these are several hundred pages 
page reports, some of them, to try to find the SAR, and they have millions of estimates, well, not millions, but they have hundreds of estimates of the SAR, so it's hard to know which one ultimately will get reported as the official estimate. Uh, but it looked like uh, the Apple iPhone 6, when it's engaged in simultaneous transmission, barely meets the SAR standard, because I saw a reading of 1.59. Uh, typically, though, when it's only uh, emitting on one frequency, it'll be more like 118 or 1.18 or 1.19, which is a lot higher than many of the competing smartphones on the on the market, especially those from Sam Samsung. So Apple clearly does not want to publicize the SAR for their phones. Well, we've got a number of callers on the line, so let's hear from Mary in Berkeley. Hi, Mary. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me, and thanks sure. for the show. Um, I'm calling because I'm wondering uh, about the difference between the intensities of smart meter radiation and versus Wi-Fi radiation versus cell phone radiation. My mom kind of refuses to get Wi-Fi in her house, and she's sure that um, that that intensity is just as just as intense. <laughs> Well, thank you. And to add to that, we just got an email from Rebecca who says, your transmitter radiates thousands of times more energy than a cell phone. Will you be shutting down your station so that you will stop inflicting us with cancer? <laughs> uh, Joel, what are your thoughts on that? And, and what about the a radio transmitter versus a cell phone? Well, in 2011, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is part of the World Health Organization, declared all radio frequency energy or radiation possibly carcinogenic. So that would include uh, radio transmitter, uh, FM, AM. Uh, however, we need a lot more research on some of these other frequencies. The, the research we do have suggests that the particular way the waves are modulated in wireless transmissions such as cellular, cordless phones, and Wi-Fi are particularly biologically active. But there, there is some evidence um, from ecologic studies showing that high-powered radio frequency transmitters uh, can be harmful to those in the near vicinity of the, of the tower. I would like to say I, I think it really depends on where the antenna is. You know, your antenna on your car is on the outside, and having interviewed and spoken with people who worked on the early car phones, um, which is a scene that sadly didn't make it in the finished film, I've been told that, you know, when they were installing these, sometimes if they were told not to touch the antenna. At one point in time, somebody did, and they kind of got like a little shock from it. So I would say that, you know, um, in terms of your phone, what's going on right now is the antenna is all around the outside of your iPhone if you happen to own an iPhone. And when they make the phones thinner and thinner, like they're doing the iPhone 6, that means the antenna is getting closer and closer to your body mm -hmm. if you keep it on your body or if you use it next to your head, that much closer to your brain. And yet at the same time, they're conversely saying in the manuals to keep it about an inch away from, their, uh, from your body. So it's sort of like they're trying to have it both ways. But I always think back to one of the first phones I had was like the Zach Morris phone, if you will, the brick. And that was a pull-out antenna. So now it's gone all the way from the antenna being, you know, a good distance away from your head to being right next to your ear. Kevin Coons is a is director of the new award-winning documentary Mobilize. It explores the potential long-term health effects from cell phone radiation. Joel Moskowitz is director of the Center for Family and Community Health at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health. He focuses on electromagnetic radiation health effects and policy. And if you have questions about the safety of your cell phone, we'd love to hear from you. We'll be back after this. <laughs> This is Your Call on KALW San Francisco. Matt Martin here with Your Call producer Becca Huckstra asking for your support. This kind of conversation about public health, about consumer information, about corporate responsibility, that is what you sustain when you support local public radio. 90 seconds, we're going to return to this conversation. Right now, we're asking for your call at 800 525 9917. You can also go online to KALW.org. The number to call is 800. The number to call is 800 525 9917, or you can donate with a click at KALW.org. 
that during this hour, we're giving away a copy of the Mobilize DVD that we're featuring on today's show. For a $100 donation, you can own this co- the, a, co- a copy of this DVD and uh, relive the health issues that we're talking about today. The number to call is 800-525-9917. We're about sharing information, making it possible to be empowered both in your personal life, how you make decisions about how you use this technology, and also saying what kind of regulation should we have around it. That's the kind of conversation from the personal to the political that happen every day on your call. If you appreciate Rose Aguilar, the conversations that she hosts and brings to the station, to the airwaves, your support makes it possible right now. 800-525-9917 or donate at klw.org. Your support makes it possible for this kind of programming on shows like Your Call, where we talk about these important health issues that don't get a lot of coverage elsewhere. We have had contributions of $50, hundred dollars we just had a five hundred dollar contribution at kalw.org whatever level you come in at you will make a difference and if you're someone who can do more we've had contributions of a thousand and five thousand dollars during this campaign be the next person to make a difference 800-525-9917 thanks This is Your Call. I'm Rose Aguilar. Coming up tomorrow, we will speak with award-winning journalist David K. Johnston about his latest book, Divided, The Perils of Our Growing Inequality. We will talk about solutions to our many economic problems with David K. Johnston. And then on Thursday, Tavis Smiley joins us to talk about his new book, Death of a King, The Real Story of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Final Year. And if you have a show idea or a guest idea, you can drop us a line, feedback at yourcallradio.org. Today, I'm speaking with Kevin Kuntz, director of the new award-winning documentary, Mobilize. It explores the potential long-term health effects from cell phone radiation, including cancer and infertility. We're also joined by Joel Moskowitz, director of the Center for Family and Community Health at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health. Joel focuses on electromagnetic radiation health effects and policy. And if you'd like to join us, the toll-free number is 866-798-8255. You can also email feedback at yourcallradio.org or leave a comment on our website yourcallradio.org. Laura writes in, I saw the documentary. This is the smoking issue of our generation. So disappointing that the government is in bed with the wireless telecom industry. We need to get the schools on board as they introduce iPads and Wi-Fi into schools and expose little kids. Maybe lower intensity, but it's consistent all day long. Thanks, a concerned mom. Um, What are your thoughts on that, Kevin? Because a number of people in the film said that a child's brain absorbs twice as much as much radiation as an adult. And Laura brings up a really great point. There's a huge rush to bring iPads into schools. So what if they are on all day on a kid's desk, for example? Well, one thing that I think about working in public education is that, you know, um, when you have a hardwired connection, you know, Ethernet connection to your computer, you get that information so much faster. So especially working with film students, which is what I was doing, um, you know, I had every single computer in our lab hardwired. Even though the school might have been thrown out Wi-Fi to everyone, when you have that hardwired connection, it's better. And especially with film slowly moving toward 4K, which is four times the red resolution of HD, you're going to need that hardwired connection. So, But that, on iPads, you can't have a hardwired connection. I know. And on the new Macs, it's, you can't have a hardwired connection. It's certainly a challenge, um, you know. And Well, yeah. so, Joel, I've been told just quickly, because we have a, a ton of phone calls, I've been told that if you're going to use the wireless, you should definitely, if your computer's in your bedroom, and I know we all have, a lot of us have computers in our bedrooms, we should turn the wireless off before we go to bed. And if you do have the option, always use the hardwire. Absolutely. Um, Both of those things are very true. Uh, A lot of people are beginning to show essentially allergic reactions from the cumulative exposure to various forms of microwave radiation, uh, ranging from the cell phone, the cordless phone, the Wi-Fi, wireless security systems, wireless baby monitors, which is a terrible, terrible idea. Um, And they develop these alert, a variety of allergic symptoms that's generally been called in most countries electromagnetic hypersensitivity or electrohypersensitivity. And these symptoms can range from headaches, ringing of the ears, fatigue, insomnia, skin conditions, heart fluctuations, or palpitations. Uh, and this is becoming more and more problematic, uh, plus few doctors know how to, how to treat this. 
Um, if on my Safer EMR website, I have an electromagnetic radiation sa- website called safer.emr.com. Uh, I have a set of l- excerpts from letters written by experts from all around the world in opposition to the Los Angeles school system's plan to adopt uh, Wi-Fi universally and put a iPad in the hands of every every student in the school district. Um, the experts have been largely ignored on this issue. I looked at four of the declarations that were submitted to the FCC, and across those four, almost 100 researchers who have published in peer-reviewed literature on electromagnetic radiation risks uh, signed signed these declarations calling for stronger government regulation, informing the public about how to use these devices safer, recommending the industry develop safer technology, and that governments fund research that is independent of industry. One of the problems right now is that many of the most prominent researchers who are still opposed to providing precautionary warnings, are they're virtually all funded by industry, and some of them for 30-year studies. Hmm. So they're taking the standpoint, which is a very self-interested one, we need to wait until these studies are over. Well, if we wait for 30 years, we're going to be in big trouble as as a global society. Well, uh, thank you for the email, Laura. We've got a related call from Nancy in Oakland. Hi, Nancy. Hi. Um, so my husband works in IT, so our house is completely wired. In addition, we have Wi-Fi. Uh, my 5-year-old uses an iPod. My 10-year-old uses a, um, an old uh, uh, iPhone 4, and of course, me and my husband both have iPhones, the 5s, and we're considering getting the 6s. So, how much potential radiation am I exposing my children to, and what can I do to reduce the radiation from this point out? Because I feel like I have been very, <laughs> I have been in a little bubble and am now being exposed to mm. all this information. And Nancy, is this something that you talk with your husband about? Uh, just, briefly, yes, but he kind of... I think it's about trying to create the dialogue there. I would start by showing him the clips on Colbert about this. Oh, it's sort of like a funny way to, you know... Stephen Colbert talked about this Yeah, issue. He, he did a very, very funny piece about the World Health Organization's big announcement uh, about cell phone radiation being a possible carcinogen. Um, Is that widely known? Because that that was pretty huge for the WHO to come out and say that. Well, I think it was huge for him to even include that on his show because you have to understand a lot of Comedy Central is like Samsung ads and right. Apple ads. So, you know, it's, it's tricky. And even when you look at an um, organization like HBO, which is independently funded, they're still very much about HBO Go, which is their mobile app. So it's sort of a challenging uh, uphill battle with, you know, in terms of films wanting to be distributed that way. Once you get the dialogue started, uh, there are a variety of tips, and I I won't go through them here and now, but if you go to my saferemr.com website, there's a link at the a one-page tip sheet at the top of the page. Uh, And other organizations like the California Brain Tumor Association and Environmental Health Trust has their own tips. So if you look across these tips, there's a lot of simple things you can do to reduce your exposures. All right. Well, thank you. I hope that helps. Again, that's safer, saferemr.com, and you can find it at yourcallradio.org. Also, if you're on Facebook, Joel runs the Electromagnetic Radiation Safety page, and he's constantly updating it. Since you brought up industry, Kevin, can mm-hmm. you talk a little bit about the power of the telecommunications industry? I mean, this is a billion-dollar industry, yeah. multi-billion. So, yeah, they they basically refuse to do an interview with me. Of course, you know, like a small independent filmmaker, they 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 won't even talk with you know Fox about this. And so, I went to a convention they were having in San Diego at the San Diego Convention Center, which is where they hold Comic Con. It's a huge, huge location. And I went there, and I started going up to different cell phone representatives and showing them the information that's in the manual, the fine print uh, warning saying, you know, safer ways to use it. And I started asking them, hey, are you aware this is in the manual? Are you aware the organization that's, you know, putting on this event is suing the city of San Francisco for wanting to take this information and putting it on the box? 
And so um, security ended up coming up to me and saying, hey, you're bothering people at this event. Um, you know, we will grant you an interview with uh, John Walls, spokesperson for the CTIA, who's actually a former Fox sports anchor. Um, but, you know, please stop asking questions because you're, you're bothering people here. And, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, having a conversation about information is, it should be something that people consider bothersome. But finally, they did grant an interview. It was very limited. I had a lot of other questions I, I wanted to ask them. And very much the answers they were giving me were not answers. They were essentially lies. And we show that in the film. And with the CTIA is the multi-billion dollar trade trade organization that lobbies for the cell phone industry founded back in 1984. Their board includes Apple, Sprint, Verizon, AT&T, Samsung, Microsoft, Qualcomm, Motorola, you name it, and they represent these telecom companies. Can you talk about the role they played when... Uh, not only the city of San Francisco decided to pass a right to no law, but also talk about Senator Mark Leno's bill, SB 932. This was a state bill. Yes. Yeah, so they lobbied against him very hard. And e even though he just wanted to provide information that said, look in your user manual for the best and safest usage. And they fought him against that. And they basically were saying, you know, this could stimulate and create conversation in the retail environment. And I just thought this is the ultimate irony. These cell phone companies, people that are all about communicating things, being afraid about conversation and their stores about this issue. Well, let's hear a clip. In this clip, you'll hear from a number of telecom industry executives testifying uh, in front of the legislature about Mark Leno's bill, SB 932. This is a clip from the documentary Mobilize. Qualcomm believes that the, the only purpose that this bill will serve is to create fear and uncertainty amongst consumers, and that will eventually just be hurtful to, uh, to, a, really to the wireless industry, which is really a California-based industry. Thank Thanks. you for your testimony. Robert Callahan with Tech America, representing 1,200 technology companies uh, nationwide, and we are opposed to the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Devine with AT&T, we oppose the legislation, and I will take the liberty with that one sentence, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one concern we have is the point Senator Leno just made moments ago, and that is this label may stimulate conversation in the retail establishment. Michael Beckler with Verizon Wireless in opposition to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ann Perkins with Sprint in opposition to the bill. Thank, Thank you. you. And Susan Lipper with T-Mobile USA in opposition. Thank you. Industry has resisted even the most minimal amount of information being disclosed. Finally, we just said in our bill, read your owner's manual for the safest uses of your phone, and they fought that as well. The more they resist, the more it makes me wonder what, in fact, are they hiding from us? The cell phone industry seems to be using the playbook of the tobacco industry in in fighting any efforts, particularly at the local level right now. And that is a clip from the documentary Mobilize. What is the status of Mark Leno's bill? It, it was shot down. And in fact, it's sad because they even shoot down legislation like another thing that he tried to pass. It was the kill switch. And, you know, that's a very simple bill, I think. This is essentially preventing people from getting their cell phones stolen, which is the most stolen item on the market in California and New York. So even getting something simple like that, which protects the consumer from th from um, theft, um, the CTIA lobbies against that even. But that did pass the session. It did yes. finally. Yes. So it gives me hope and, and you know, it, it makes me think that eventually we will pass these bills. You know, it's interesting. We did a show yesterday about GMO labeling and th another documentary. And the, the goal of that one was, well, why can't we just have this information? If GMOs are safe, shouldn't we be able to decide if we want to eat this stuff, right? Yeah. And that's what you're saying mm -hmm. is why can't we just know the the fine print on your phone where you have to take five steps to find it and you can't make the font bigger, why can't we just have this information and, and then make decisions? And it's especially ironic because the Federal Communications Commission, which is the organization which regulates the radiation and safety levels of cell phones, actually requires cell phone companies to tell you to keep the phone this specific distance away from your body because that's how they test the cell phone against the body. So, but now we're in a situation where someone from the CTIA, the cell phone lobbying group, is now the head of the Federal Communications Commission. Um, and how did they get in that position? A whole lot of lobbying 
and directly with Obama. It was around $700,000 that he donated to Obama's campaign. And I actually found a video clip of him saying, would you ever be a part of his administration? He said, oh, no, of course not. And, of course, a couple of years later, what does he do? Becomes the head of the FCC. One of the, the most... Po- of- oh, sorry. Yeah, the city of Berkeley is, is will soon consider uh, an ordinance that will probably be very similar to the version of the law, the l- last version of the law that Mark Leno tried to pass in the state legislature, simply saying, look at your cell phone manual and take some precaution. Uh, the industry has already threatened the city even before it was proposed to the city council that it, that it will sue. Uh, the CTIA has been a really bad actor even after that kill switch bill was passed they were in opposition even though apple and much of the industry said that they would go along with it uh i think we should seize the opportunity and mobilize i've been studying tobacco related tobacco prevention research in the 70s the reason why we have such good smoke-free laws now and smoke-free public and smoke-free workplaces is because cities in the bay area got together and passed very modest laws initially workplace smoking laws uh, and eventually, over time, a grassroots movement developed, which enabled us to get statewide laws and, and better regulation, which is now covering half the population in the U.S. So I think the Bay Area cities should follow Berkeley, use Berkeley's ordinance as a model, and begin to adopt similar laws. The industry has a much more difficult time f- fighting cities if they band together. That's one thing we learned from the tobacco control struggle in the United States. That is Joel Moskowitz, director of the Center for Family and Community Health at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health, where he focuses on electromagnetic radiation. Kevin Coons is director of the documentary Mobilize that explores the potential long-term health effects from cell phone radiation. Uh, We have an email from Eric who says, I'm a physician and I've seen the literature. If you ask the Mayo Clinic, they state, quote, the bottom line, for now, no one knows if cell phones are capable of causing cancer. Although long-term studies are ongoing, to date there's no convincing evidence that cell phone use increases the risk of cancer. End quote. Joel, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I know at least 100 experts who have done research, published research, and that would take issue with that that comment. We don't have convincing evidence. I mean, we don't have conclusive evidence. But I think most most researchers now are convinced that we have enough certainly to warrant precautionary warnings and to create more stringent regulation of this uh, radiation. Well, what is a citizen supposed to do? Because the Mayo Clinic is an, a, an incredibly established institution. And if you read that, what are you supposed to think? Well, I would reference a study from the Cleveland Clinic that deals with sperm damage. And there are actually a dozen studies that look at sperm damage and show conclusive results, as well as recent research at Yale that looks at pregnancy. And unfortunately, they're the only study in the United States that has ever looked at cell phone radiation in pregnancy. I find that concerning. And I think that you can't just look at the Mayo Institute and say, oh, they think that it's safe. Have they ever done any research on this? Probably not. And we, we have to remember, too, it took us about a half a century or more, actually, before uh, of research on lung cancer from tobacco hmm. use, cigarette smoking, before people were willing to say, before there was a consensus that it, it was causing lung cancer. I, I would say that you'd be very surprised to find there would probably be someone within the Mayo Clinic who would disagree with that statement they're making. At least that's what I've found. I've spoken with a lot of people from the American Cancer Society who disagree with their official position on this issue and have considered quitting their jobs because they are that upset about it. I've spoken with people at Kaiser Permanente who have done research on this issue in China, yet Kaiser Permanente doesn't really want to make this issue too vocal. So I think that, you know, there are a lot of individuals at these organizations who I think would oppose those, you know, blank statements. There seems to also be a struggle in the media. You've got a clip about how a lot of uh, media outlets ignore some of these studies. Um, Chris Ketchum at GQ had to sit on a piece for a year after fighting with the editorial board about what we're talking about today because cell phone companies threatened to pull the ads. The piece actually did run, but it ran a year later. Mm -hmm. And he actually wanted to do an interview for the documentary, but was sort of a little bit afraid and concerned about doing that because he said, you know, I'm a journalist working in this competitive environment. I just had a child this year. So, you know, even though he writes an article about this, he's still sort of afraid to be too vocal on it. And if you look at that 
article, it sort of watered down the cell phone, um, you know, near field exposure issue side of it. But yeah, I would definitely say it's it's very difficult for news organizations to get word out about this. And I think in large part, it comes down to who's owning these, you know, media companies. You look at the Washington Post now, it's owned by Amazon, a cell phone company now. You know, I would be very concerned if the San Francisco Chronicle was bought by Apple or Google, but I don't know why people are okay with Washington Post being owned by Amazon. I, I think some of the broadcast media is concerned about its own liability. I heard a story recently from a, a longtime employee of a major uh, network-owned uh, TV station, and in, as part of a story he was going to do on smart meters, he, he borrowed an RF meter and went into the studio and found very high readings in a part of the studio where most of the employees were working. Hmm. And the next thing he he knew is he heard from the corporate lawyers that, A, not only are you not going to show this footage on the air, if you ever bring an RF meter into the studio again, or if you mention what you found to any of the employees, you will be fired on the spot. And I think he'd been with them for about two decades. You know, this speaks to David's question, and I think about this a lot when I'm on the train or at a concert. Uh, he says, at any given concert or sports event, virtually everyone has a cell phone, and almost all of them are on. Have there been any measurements of radiation when so many people are packed into a confined space? Not that I'm aware of. In fact, some of the newer stadiums are putting Wi-Fi routers, essentially, or cellular routers right under the seats to try to boost the capacity of the network. Uh, so the exposures are probably quite high. There was a study in public transit in Israel, and they found if a third of the people on a bus or train during rush hour were using their cell phone, a person without a cell phone would be exposed to more than the legal limit. So those must be very high exposures because the legal limit is, is clearly inadequate for protecting us. Uh, we have a, a number of phone calls about the health effects of Bluetooth because a lot of people use that. Joel, what can you tell us? What have the studies said about Bluetooth? I have yet to see any Bluetooth studies. The intensity from Bluetooth is much lower, but the cumulative exposure, if you keep the device on all day long, could be quite substantial. Uh, so this is a concern. The, another thing is LTE, the fourth generation, newest, latest, greatest cell phone technology. There's only been one study that's been published so far, and it shows that a 30-minute exposure alters the brain activity on both sides of the head. Do Bluetooth earbuds and wired earpieces block against radiation? This just came in from Richard. Do you know? Uh, the, the earbud, well, the Bluetooth earbud does not block against the radiation. The, the, wire, the advantage of a wired headset is that it reduces your exposure if you keep the device away from the body. And certainly keeping it away from the head is a good thing. There's some debate about whether the cord functions as an antenna or not. But I haven't seen any published research indicating that's, that's a problem. And, and Joel, um, just about 25 seconds, what, what tips would you give people who want to limit radiation? Uh, go to my saferemr.com well, well, website. Well, what do you do? Uh, I basically don't carry the device on me when it's turned on. I keep it on my desk during the day when it is turned on. I use a headset or a speakerphone mostly. Uh, when I do use it. I hardly use it at all, though, so I'm not a good example since I'm either at home or in my office and I have a landline in both both places. And, Kevin, how did this change your relationship with the phone? About 20 seconds. You know, I actually feel like I use my cell phone more than ever before, but I use it in a much safer way. I always use speakerphone. I never put it in my pocket. Uh, if it's on, I'll always turn it off if I put it in my pocket. And, you know, if I'm at work, I usually put it on my desk or somewhere I can see it. And, you know, I, I feel like I can serve my battery very well doing these things. And, you know, it's just I, I use it more than ever. Kevin Coons is director of the award-winning documentary Mobilize that looks at potential long-term health effects from cell phone radiation. And Joel Moskowitz is director of the Center for Family and Community Health at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health.